Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Paul Wilson, Executive Director of Planning, Business Development and International Relations at Index Holding and a member of DHAD International Scientific Advisory Board, DISAP. Welcome to this evening's webinar brought to you by Waterfalls Education in collaboration between DHAD and International Humanitarian City. We are delighted to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Giuseppe Saba, Chief Executive Officer of International Humanitarian City. Giuseppe Saba has been the CEO of Dubai's International Humanitarian City since March 2017, with over 34 years of extensive experience in the humanitarian field with the United Nations and international organizations. He is a leading logistics and support services expert. He is also the founder of the United Nations Humanitarian Response Depot Network, the UNHRD, and in 2000, he set up with the support of the UN World Food Programme, WFP, the first UNHRD in Brindisi, southeast of Italy. This served as a consortium of UN agencies and international humanitarian organizations, which included governmental and non-governmental entities. Following the experience acquired during the emergency response to the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004, he developed and expanded UNHRD into the extensive network it is today. By opening hubs and negotiating agreements with various hosting governments in Dubai, Malaysia, Ghana, Spain, and Panama. As a result of his efforts, the UNHRD became one of the largest international humanitarian platforms, consisting of approximately 90 partners operating in emergency preparedness and response. Giuseppe is an Italian citizen born in 1951 in Sardinia. He is married and has two daughters. Since his retirement from the UNWFP in 2013, he has served as a consultant to various humanitarian agencies, including the Norwegian Refuge, Refugee Council and the ASEAN Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance on Disaster Management, the AHA Center. The topic for today's webinar is COVID-19, the IHC's role and accomplishments. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, throughout the presentation, you will have the chance to use the Q&A tab for questions uh, related to the presentation, questions for Mr. Giuseppe, and we will do our best to ask those questions to Giuseppe later on in the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Giuseppe to this evening's webinar. It's good to see you, Giuseppe, and over to you for your presentation. Giuseppe, your microphone, please. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I hope that is visible. So uh, thank you very much to Diad for uh, giving to IHC this opportunity of sharing uh, what uh, we did, uh, what we are currently doing, what we are planning for uh, supporting operations for the coronavirus. Thanks even on behalf of the humanitarian community. I know that you had uh, Sophie from ICRC. You are going to have after me even uh, Mario from Medicine Sans Frontier. And this is uh, really a great opportunity for the full community of uh, IEC to share our experience. Well, let me introduce first the International Humanitarian City. The word international for me is extremely important. And the reason behind this is the fact that, uh, first of all, uh, IEC is not a regional humanitarian hub, but is an international humanitarian hub. We operated in recent uh, periods into the Pacific Island, into Vanuatu. We operated even into Haiti, in the Caribbean, in addition to operating into the Southeast Asia, Middle East, and African countries. Originally, IHC was uh, composed by two different entities, aid city and humanitarian city, which were merged together in 2005, 2006, and composed the international humanitarian city. 
occupying 30,000 square meter space behind the beautiful uh, building of the Burj Khalifa in Business Bay in, here in Dubai. And uh, later on in uh, 2011, was moved into the current location. If I should look into the mandate of uh, IHC, we used to define ourselves as uh, a proactive uh, entity supporting the efforts of uh, our humanitarian community. And to be proactive means that we are feeling to be part uh, of the international community. We feel to be even uh, humanitarian operators. You just read my, my CV, my history, 35 years more or less that uh, I'm working in the humanitarian environment. So we feel really to be part of the humanitarian community and not, uh, let me say, bureaucrats administering uh, a condominium of uh, approximately 80 members. No, we are really feeling to be part of the humanitarian community. The law governing the international humanitarian city has uh, four very interesting goals to establish, first of all, within the Emirate of Dubai, the international hub and to secure logistical infrastructures, to develop humanitarian services in a non-profit free zone, and to actively provide an efficient and emergency preparedness and response platform. And those three goals are always ongoing. But my favorite goal is the fourth one, in the sense that is to create a favorable environment that support and develop innovation and sustainable humanitarian activities for me is the main driver into the future. Dubai, as you can see from this map, we are really, geographically speaking, we are in a strategic position because in uh, between four, eight hours flight, we can reach the two thirds of the world population. And then talking about that world population seated uh, in Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa, Two-thirds of the world population living close to prone areas, frequently affected by natural disasters. Unfortunately, some areas are even conflict zones. We are even seated close to the manufacturers of the humanitarian aid. Now, many people that are part of our audience, I believe that they so frequently, they move of the materials needed for combating the coronavirus flying from China into Europe, for example, or into many other countries. And this is because exactly large part of the humanitarian aids, as well as medical supplies are manufactured in China, in India, in Pakistan, Malaysia, and so on. So to be seated in Dubai is even uh, a cost benefit when uh, we are importing into Dubai the humanitarian aid. Physically, IHC is located in uh, close to the Jebel Ali port and the Al Maktoum airport. So logistically speaking, is even in a big advantageous position. And if we look into the other infrastructures of uh, Dubai, in terms of logistics, then everybody knows how many flights used to come into Dubai, how many flights used to leave Dubai, which is the outreach of the national carrier, the Emirates, or Etihad, and many other companies. Now, all of those uh, aircrafts usually used to transport even uh, cargoes. So this is the reason why large part of the humanitarian community has been attracted into Dubai. And we will see later on how is composed this uh, humanitarian community. Our logistics infrastructure are, of course, uh, offices where we have even conference facilities. And then we have even uh, an evacuation center 
And the evacuation center is destined towards uh, all of those colleagues that uh, due to crisis in uh, some uh, countries, they are obliged to leave the country immediately and uh, they can be evacuated into Dubai. This happened in the past, the most recent one, as far as I remember, was last year. Some colleagues from GIZ evacuated from uh, Afghanistan and they came into Dubai. So they have available this space in order to continue to monitor their own projects. And then uh, our uh, warehouse compound is a massive warehouse compound where we have uh, warehouses specialized for uh, storing uh, generic uh, humanitarian aid, as well as those uh, medical items or special food that need the temperature control or uh, open areas in order to store uh, containers, to store uh, vehicles, large assets, and then uh, refrigerated cells because of course some medicines or vaccines required even uh, the refrigerated cell. So cold chain basically. And then we, this is how our last innovation, a kitting center is a semi-automated kitting center. It will be, uh, go, is going to start uh, the operations in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we are going to contract a company in order to manage it and to support our uh, members in preparing kitting. Kitting, just to give you an example of kits, are, for example, the schooling box of UNICEF for uh, the emergency health kits managed by WHO or the same personal protection equipment kits and so on. But let's just move into our member community. We are talking about 76 organizations. Two thirds of those organizations are humanitarian organizations and, say, and the one third we are talking about commercial companies. Looking into this uh, slide, you will see the many members of the United Nations family. You will see even other uh, important international humanitarian organization, ICRC, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Society, Save the Children, Medicine Sans Frontier, many others. Of course, even governmental organizations such as the GIZ. And then you will see within the commercial companies that we have uh, manufacturers of uh, humanitarian aid or uh, logistics company. Now, the combination and the collocation together of uh, humanitarian organizations and uh, commercial companies should not be interpreted absolutely as a facilitating the business of the commercial company. No, please try to see the value added of the commercial companies. And this is uh, where I was mentioning before the, full, the, uh, the fourth goal in order to create uh, a proper environment in order to focus into a sustainable humanitarian action. As you noted, we have uh, more than 430 colleagues working within the international humanitarian city. Think about them, think about uh, those that spent years and years in the field and try to calculate how many years of experience those guys gain. It will be really pity if we are going to lose this kind of experience. We are not going to share it with uh, our future generation of humanitarian workers. To accede into the humanitarian studies today in this region is literally impossible. So uh, students are obliged to go into Europe, into the United States. And I believe that uh, it is our uh, job to help them to accede into the humanitarian studies and to embrace a future even within the humanitarian community. And this is one of the reasons why uh, 
as IHC, we started in uh, signing agreements with academic institutions here in the United Arab Emirates. I was mentioning before the commercial companies. The commercial companies are those that are holding the technologies. And uh, we, as uh, humanitarian workers, that we spent years in the field, we know which are our challenges, our problems when we are in the field. And uh, what I believe is that if we start in sharing our concerns with the commercial companies, then together really we can find solutions. This is the platform that uh, is meant to be IHC. And then if you add to the innovators and young entrepreneurs, I believe that really we can close the circle and to drive IHC into the future with uh, this uh, goal. And yeah, we yeah. are. This uh, session is related to the coronavirus pandemic. What was IHC community ready for responding to the coronavirus? Well, what I did is that I went uh, through the dashboard that you have in front of you last January. <clears throat> Looking into the dashboard, my colleagues from uh, the World Health Organization the colleagues of uh, UNHRD, they had, uh, let me say, a certain level of stocks, uh, such as personal protection equipment and other items which were compatible with uh, the response for the coronavirus. Obvious that they were not, they are incidentally in stock. I believe that many of you remember that uh, we had uh, very recently some uh, epidemic with Ebola, with the avian flu. So lessons learned, something was already there. If we are looking, if you are asking me in terms of quantity, if it was sufficient, then I can tell you no, absolutely, because nobody was expecting to enter into a pandemic situation where the demand is really massive. Let me spend even a couple of minutes on the humanitarian logistics data bank because this is another innovation that together with uh, my colleagues belonging to the humanitarian community in Dubai, we built up together. Innovative because uh, we are using the customs transactions in order to track the incoming and outgoing. And I would like to show you a few minutes of a video explaining in detail this uh, humanitarian logistics uh, data bank. Communication between various humanitarian organizations is a daily necessity. This need is accentuated when a disaster strikes. However, time is never on their side. This is the Dubai International Humanitarian City and here we respond on time. Imagine a platform that allows real-time information sharing on humanitarian aid stocks and flow, providing the global humanitarian community with information on the exact positioning of critical relief items, their quantity, location, ownership and movement. You don't have to imagine it. It has become a reality. The Humanitarian Logistics Data Bank. The deal is that if a disaster strikes, people will be able to see what supplies where. The Humanitarian Logistics Data Bank marks a milestone for cooperation amongst humanitarian actors in regards to emergency preparedness and response. Logistics makes or breaks many of the operations where we're involved in. This will help the United Nations and our NGO partners do something we were never able to do before. The data bank ensures a global mapping of aid, improved coordination, and document humanitarian assistance to better serve those in need. Having the data bank will increase the effectiveness and efficiency of the use of the facility. By employing automated tracking of aid movements, based on customs data from ports, airports and other entry points, 
the data bank allows record time response to humanitarian crisis. Well, this database is really going to save lives, save money, and do, I think, uh, immeasurable good around the world. Furthermore, this tool avoids overlaps of humanitarian aid and optimizes interventions. The data bank gives to both affected countries and humanitarian actors in crisis-torn areas access to updated information on the availability of relief items in humanitarian depots and warehouses. Today, in Dubai's international humanitarian city, tomorrow, in other humanitarian hubs. Well, staying on the question that uh, we asked ourselves if really we were ready, then let me add that uh, as I see last December, I submitted to the board of directors a triennium plan in order to optimize our storage space, in order to create uh, the kitchen center, in order to create the cold chain center. Well, the triennium plan has been accelerated and uh, we are trying to implement it in a period of uh, in between uh, three and four months, which means that we are increasing our storage space in about 22,000 pallet position more. And uh, we activate uh, immediately the emergency task force, which is not just a meeting. It's a, a delegation of authorities, a special delegation of authority that is uh, assigned to the CEO, through which you can access to funds in order to charter aircrafts and as well as to fill gaps, uh, according to the requirements coming from the humanitarian community. And then a contingency plan, which allowed me, for example, to take additional 9,000 square meter, which means that today we are operating in 140,000 square meter of space with the full IHC. We still have uh, other option for expanding further according to the demand that is coming from the humanitarian community. And we can even increase the storage space under temperature control or as cold chain. So that is our contingency plan. If you look at this slide, it's comparing the first five months of 2019 with the first five months of 2020. As you can see, the number of transactions grow up exponentially. The incoming value of the humanitarian aid, again, increased exponentially from 23 million to 47 in, within this same period. Even the outbound from 28 million passed into 46 million. So there is really an increase of stock on the 46%. The same WFP stock increased 27% and WHO stock really increased impressively for the 243%. And if we look in particular the response to the coronavirus 19, then you will see that WHO performed the 44% of the deliveries, the WFP the 33% and others the 22%. The World Health Organization alone basically reached 105 countries. So, but, uh, for WHO in particular, please allow me to show you the statement from my friend and colleague Robert, who's managing the humanitarian operations here in Dubai on behalf of the World Health Organization. In 2019, WHO began expanding logistics capabilities here at the International Humanitarian City in Dubai. We expanded our physical footprint by adding over 8,000 square meters of temperature controlled storage space and also the number of staff working to support the emergency response. Since the start of COVID-19, 
Uh, we've dispatched over 200 shipments across 105 countries to all six WHO geographic regions from South America to the Western Pacific. We estimate that we've protected over 1 million healthcare workers by providing them with the PPE, laboratory diagnostics, and critical biomedical devices needed to treat COVID-19 patients. The scale and speed of our response would not be possible without the tremendous support we receive from the International Humanitarian City and the government of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you. Well, what Robert was saying basically was referring to multilateral uh, actions supported by the UAE government, the United Arab Emirates government, supported by the International Humanitarian City. And uh, this is really a, a combined action that was really impressive and is still impressive. And the response, even bilateral response from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the United Arab Emirates. These four photos are showing you aids that have been provided bilaterally by the UAE government to the Federation of Russia, to Cuba, to the United Kingdom, and myself as Italian, I remember very well the flight that was uh, that landed in Rome some time ago, providing support to the Italian government and to the Italian population. So there is no doubt that. Uh, if we combine the multilateral and the bilateral, I'm really proud about what uh, UAE is doing and what is leaving from uh, this country in this uh, period. Interesting, even the interagency worldwide logistics support that is putting in place uh, work the program on behalf, of course, of the full humanitarian community. I saw that my colleagues are using the various national and regional depots in order to move from China and from other humanitarian apps and to serve the world worldwide. This is, in my opinion, really a very, very big challenge for different reasons. And now, going into the conclusion of my presentation. The challenges, the big challenge in my opinion is the, the crash of the supply chain. And you know, supply chain means uh, manufacturing, means uh, transporting, means uh, storing, means distribution. Now, when uh, you start in having uh, countries uh, which are affected by a pandemic uh, such as the coronavirus, everybody looking into personal protection equipment, ventilators, reagents for the tests, and uh, knowing that almost everything is coming from the same area, it's really dramatic. And when you start having ground that quite a lot of passenger aircraft means that uh, whatever was moved by air in terms of uh, cargo now has been limited and pushed into only purely cargo aircraft. We saw, I believe, through television, through articles, even the conversion immediately of passenger aircraft into combi aircraft in order to transport cargo and so on. But if you look at this picture in the middle with the green jacket, you have uh, David Besley uh, close to a military aircraft of the UAE Air Force because today the big support is coming from the militaries, military assets, which are available and which really can support uh, the big operations that are conducted by the humanitarian community. I mentioned before that we are even planning and uh, we hope by end of August to have multiple 
refrigerated cells in order to host medical items and vaccines, which means that uh, IHC will be ready really by end of August, ready to host and to store massive quantities of vaccines and we hope that uh, is going to come up soon. But let's just look a little bit beyond of the coronavirus. How to respond to other emergencies. Together with the colleagues of UNHCR recently, we did a joint flight, WHO, World Health Organization and UNHCR for assisting the population of Somalia from one side, uh, affected by floods and simultaneously uh, affected by the coronavirus. We are going to move into the hurricane season and let us think seriously how the humanitarian community should cope with the other emergencies. And not only because uh, we have ongoing operations. You saw before David Besley, Filippo Granti, and uh, keep in mind that the assistance to the refugees must continue. The WF has to continue to fight hunger. UNICEF has to continue with the children assistance and so on. Those are really the challenges that I'm seeing in front of uh, the humanitarian community for uh, the next period. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for uh, having be patient and uh, taking this half hour together with me. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Giuseppe, uh, very much for that uh, detailed presentation and, and sharing with us all of the amazing work that's going on uh, in the uh, International Humanitarian City today. Um, one of the things that uh, obviously you're, you're really experts in is logistics and, uh, and supply. Uh, can you expand a little bit on the how the the flights have affected you? You mentioned passenger airplanes, so I, I, I'm assuming that a lot of freight previous to COVID was was also uh, on some of the passenger airlines as well as the cargo planes and the reduction of passenger flights has affected this distribution. Of course, uh, Paul, uh, keep in mind that just to give you the example of the Emirates. Emirates airline is using predominantly Airbus 380, Boeing 777, which have a certain capacity for moving stocks in their own bellies. And uh, keeping in mind that many, or at least in some countries, a lot in some other less. But once you look into our table, when we are going to get dinner or lunch, part of that food uh, frequently is uh, flying from uh, a country into another. And that is the reason why I was saying before, once you have quite a lot of passenger aircraft which have been grounded, obvious that the, the cargo, the food, medicines, medical supplies, humanitarian aid, they are going into those uh, limited number of purely cargo aircraft, which are not really uh, a small fleet, is a large fleet, but cannot cope absolutely and today, really, when, when you think uh, the various inconvenience, the various constraints, uh, then really it's uh, literally impossible to not call for the generosity of uh, many countries that they have uh, a good uh, fleet of uh, military air assets. And this is what the humanitarian community is looking for through the World Food Program today, which still represents the logistics arm and, the, and is uh, serving as a common service for the full humanitarian community. Sure. And Giuseppe, I mean, uh, it's one thing, uh, as you say, if you've, if you've got the goods and the products, you've got to get them from A to B. As you mentioned, uh, 
Dubai is, is, is in a fantastic location for when it comes to serving the humanitarian uh, environment uh, and some of the crisis uh, areas that we have um, across the world. So in terms of uh, volume, do you uh, or exercise any opportunities of collaboration when it comes to storage within Dubai, uh, other free zones? Is that something on your radar? As, as, the, as the volume of uh, humanitarian aid may increase through donations or through manufacturing, are you equipped with collaborations to expand the uh, storage facilities through collaboration? You know, Paul, we are constantly in touch uh, with uh, our colleagues that are operating in this uh, worldwide network because, uh, yes, we are expecting massive uh, stocks coming into Dubai in the forthcoming weeks. Uh, I have bring three announced about 60 containers plus a certain number of flights. The action taken as of today from our side as international humanitarian city, uh, as I said, we are increasing 22,000 pallet position, which is not really peanuts, it's, uh, it's quite a lot of space. But in addition to that, uh, our landlord already made available 9,000 square meter and is ready to make available additional storage space. This additional space, keep in mind that they are giving us just on for one dirham per square meter per year, which means that is more a sort of donation because there is nothing to gain financially from this offer. But this is really part of the, the cooperation among the various entities here in uh, Dubai and in the United Arab Emirates, even under the customs point of view that usually you, know, you have to move papers and so on, the Ministry of Health authorization from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Everything came out that we are going to solve everything online just in a couple of hours and the goods are coming in and leaving the country without any problem. Yes, I have a contingency plan. In the worst scenario that I'm not able to cope with the demand, I already agreed with uh, the Jebel Ali Free Zone, with uh, other entities to host uh, some uh, humanitarian aid, as well as I uh, secured some space, especially for cold chain, because this is something that is uh, really unpredictable. Um, I don't believe that uh, from here to August, uh, we are going to get a request for hosting vaccines, but anyway, we would like to be ready. This is part of the concept of uh, emergency preparedness and not only response. So mm, we are in a position today to cope, but we have even our contingency plan. Sure, because you mentioned uh, lessons learned earlier. You talked about uh, Ebola and uh, avian flu. Uh, we of course, we all hope that uh, we'll see a vaccine um, at some point uh, in the near future. And I guess that that will in itself be a massive distribution, storage and distribution um, process that we will go through. So um, those experiences from Ebola and avian flu, they, they stand you in good stead when it comes to hopefully the distribution of a vaccine for the COVID. Yes, for sure. Uh, you know, when uh, last December I entered into the board of directors and I asked them to authorize me to invest uh, some money into the Keating Center, into a cold chain center for setting up multiple uh, refrigerated cells in order to store vaccines and uh, other medicines requiring between two and six degrees or up to minus 26. For sure, I was not expecting to get in a few months a pandemic situation for the coronavirus. Uh, I don't believe that, <coughs> I don't have any crystal ball with me, but what we have in our hands are lessons learned. And this is what should drive us in the emergency preparedness and response. In the sense that, okay, we had uh, 
some time ago, the Ebola situation, we had the avian flu. We know what the two epidemics, uh, how they impact the storage space, how they impact the cold chain. So we must be ready. And this is the reason why when we sit around the table and we discuss about lessons learned is exactly in order to pass from the words into action and not just to produce books that we are going to put into a drawer and then we forget about them, no thanks. We have to transform them immediately into actions. Yeah, thank you, Giuseppe. Um, I'll move to, uh, we're getting a few questions from the, the participants. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the great work that's being done out of IHC in Dubai in relation to COVID-19. The questioner is asking, is the IHC and indeed the UAE um, receiving the appropriate credit for its invaluable contributions to a large number of under-equipped countries in the context of COVID-19? Um, uh, it's a good question. Uh, it's a very, let me say, it's quite difficult to, to get uh, not only the proper credit, I believe that credits uh, when uh, we have uh, bilateral or multilateral uh, operations, of course the recipients are uh, recognizing are uh, of course uh, extremely uh, are recognizing the generosity, but when uh, we go into, let me say, the visibility, then uh, this is a little bit uh, difficult. And uh, at least, uh, you know, I'm one of those who, who clearly follow usually the news, the Italian news, the Spain news, the Euro news. And honestly speaking, yes, I believe that uh, uh, credit has been given to IHC, Credit has been given to the United Arab Emirates, uh, but again, I'm extremely proud about the United Arab Emirates for uh, the response that has been given to this uh, pandemic situation. Absolutely. Um, Giuseppe, uh, funding, uh, we never saw this a few months ago, uh, something I mentioned uh, previously in a webinar. How do you manage your do you have to make some adjustments now to your financial uh, structure? Uh, uh, is that uh, keeping you awake at night? Or uh, how do you go about that, that challenge, these big change? Uh, okay, mm, let me say that uh, historically, mm, IHC had uh, always uh, a good luck because uh, as far as concerned, uh, let me say what I used to call the running cost uh, are ensured by the government of Dubai. But when we talk about supporting the operations, uh, this is where uh, we have uh, some funds which are not absolutely unlimited funds. But I have to admit even that uh, we counted always on the generosity of uh, Isaiah and Sheikh Mohammed, who frequently made available his own private jet uh, for uh, moving cargos. I believe that you saw twice in the video, a Jumbo, a Boeing 747, blue and white, which is exactly belongs to Isaiah's. And uh, I was really looking into a statistic and uh, we had period where we activate even air bridge between Dubai, for example, and Bangladesh during the first period of the Rohingya, you know, 13 flights with a Boeing 747, just to give you some figures today for moving uh, for seeing a Boeing 747 taking off and doing uh, some hours flights up to a month ago, two months ago, it used to cost around 500, 600,000 US dollars, just the transport. Today, in order to get uh, 
a 747 taking off and landing uh, after eight hours, nine hours is going to cost much more than a million dollars. So it's really expensive. So um, again, uh, this is a, a personal recognition that I have uh, together with the full humanitarian community vis-a-vis -vis China Sheikh Mohammed because never denied the, the availability of his own aircraft. And when uh, his own aircraft was uh, busy, then uh, we got even cash in order to, or authorized to use other funds in order to provide the assistance to the, to the humanitarian community and to the beneficiary. The last example is the flight, that the joint flight World Health Organization, UNHCR, together with international humanitarian city flying into Mogadishu, into Somalia for the coronavirus and for the floods. This is a, a nice segue in a way to the, one of the questions from one of our participants and, and uh, I'll paraphrase it a little bit. Uh, the question is talking about the use of seaports. Is this something that you consider uh, dispatching any of the supplies by sea? Is that something that's in your logistics uh, operation or something you've done before or would do? Of of course, of course, whatever is in the proximity of Dubai that you can reach, you know, in uh, two, three hours, uh, uh, sorry, in two, three days, four days sailing, obvious that uh, we need to use them. Yeah, we are talking about uh, a proper use uh, <clears throat> of the funds available. Uh, the reason why almost uh, all the humanitarian aid in normal condition used to come into Dubai by vessels by sea. And then, of course, living in emergency, they are going to be dispatched by, by air. But I'm expecting, I was uh, saying before that uh, I'm waiting 60 containers from uh, World Food Program containing three hospital structures, uh, which means that for each hospital structure, you have 20 40 foot containers, which means that uh, are going to be dispatched most probably by sea, because otherwise you have to do a, a huge number of uh, flights. But again, this is a preposition that is exactly with the purpose of using even sea transport. Yes, into the supply chain, you have to consider the sea transport for sure. And intermodal transport is always the best scenario. Yeah, we have a, a specific question about the, the, the Air Force, and I'll quote it. For, have you seen, uh, having seen, you have made much use of the UAE Air Force aircraft recently. Would you agree with the following phrase, uh, apparently pronounced by one old humanitarian old timer? <laughs> when the task is truly enormous, e.g. major earthquakes, tsunamis, there is no resource that matches that of the military. Uh, well, uh, the, the use of the, the air forces, I can tell you uh, my first assignment within the United Nations was during the Balkan War. And trust me, they are the militaries who are moving the humanitarian aid. And even the military sacrificed lives for moving uh, humanitarian aids uh, into many uh, operations. Of course, uh, uh, I have been seated during the 2004 tsunami for uh, three months in the Subang uh, military airport, uh, operating four flights per day with uh, military aircrafts. Uh, of course, it's always a combination. Uh, in this period, uh, there is no doubt uh, uh, military assets are those that are available. And uh, let's us thank for the generosity of those countries that are making available their own uh, military assets or uh, national carriers in order to move the aid. Uh, let me say that today, with uh, a lot of uh, passengers aircraft grounded uh, 
is a, is a mandatory, is a mandatory to, to request even their own support. Sure. Uh, slightly different question, uh, more about the, the, uh, the operation area. Uh, you mentioned that you have a hub in uh, Ghana. Uh, the attendee is asking if that's the only hub that you have in Africa, uh, or do you have plans to have any more hubs in Africa? And would part of that strategy, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, be uh, through these hubs to source the supplies more regionally? Uh, and using uh, appropriate technology in those hubs. So Ghana, any other hubs in the pipeline? No, uh, let me clarify. Ghana is not uh, a, an IHC hub. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say that according to my mapping, uh, Ghana is uh, part of the UNHRD network together with uh, the other app that is uh, in the Canary Islands, in Las Palmas de Gran Canaria, the app that is in uh, Panama, the one that I'm hosting here in uh, Dubai, then the HRD that is in Malaysia, and the number one that is in uh, Brindisi in southeast of Italy, which is the first HRD that was set up in 2000 and that developed into the NHRD network. No, uh, Honestly speaking, what uh, I'm trying to do, thanks to the Humanitarian Logistics Data Bank, which is uh, a starting point for me in order to aggregate together all of those humanitarian hubs, or if you prefer, I used to call them sister humanitarian cities, because in addition to the ones that are under the UNHRD umbrella, you have even other hubs for example, one located in Australia, uh, others managed by UNHCR in Jordan, in Kenya, and in Cameroon. And uh, this is where I believe that we have to work all together. Uh, when uh, I had in mind to create the UNHRD network, the purpose was to bring the humanitarian aid as much as possible close to the prone areas in order to avoid the last minute uh, need. And, uh, and this uh, coronavirus pandemic is confirming to me that uh, the emergency preparedness by including prepositioning stocks is still valid, is a must, and is not absolutely an option. It is a must if you want to be ready for responding to emergencies. So my dream is to embrace the same, let me say, way together with the other sister humanitarian cities. I started in working with them thanks to the logistics data bank, which is not only and exclusively an approach with uh, the humanitarian organizations, but is, uh, is even uh, a cooperation with the hosting government of those uh, humanitarian hubs, in the sense that I'm working closely with the government of Panama today, with the customs of Panama, with the customs of Accra, with the customs of Malaysia and so on, because uh, this is a relationship between government and government. I'm representing a government as a CEO of the International Humanitarian City. Thank you, Giuseppe. Um, it's amazing how time moves so quickly. So we have uh, just a few more minutes. So I'm going to uh, have three more questions for you. One from the, the audience, and this is about procurement. Uh, maybe you can help in relation to this. I'm sure you can. Uh, is there a, a mutual procurement office that manages purchases during this pandemic? Or does each organization manage their own purchases? Well, uh... I can respond that uh, usually each organization manages its own uh, procurement. However, within the United Nations, there is the good habit of uh, sharing the agreements. Let me give you a quick example. If I'm going into the market for procuring 1,000 tents per year, 
the market is looking in, in a certain manner. If I'm going to add my thousand tents or blankets to the UNHCR big volume, then I'm going to get a totally different price. So this is what usually happens within the, within the humanitarian world. Within the United Nations, they, have a com uh, they are sharing their own uh, contracts and so on. Then you have, of course, uh, some other procurement process, such as the, those recognized by, by ECHO, for example, UNHRD is a recognized procurement center by the, the, the humanitarian office of the European Union. So it's uh, myself when I'm in the need, I will try to use or a humanitarian procurement center or I'm going straight myself into the market, for example, for the for chartering the aircraft, I prefer to go straight myself. Thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, moving direction slightly, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about DHUD, which will take place, uh, of course, uh, the 17th edition on the 15th to 17th of March, uh, 2021. Um, the theme, uh, Aid After Coronavirus, a focus on Africa. Would you like to uh, comment on that theme for us, please? Sure, for me it's a, it's a good opportunity. First of all, for analyzing lessons learned. Here the lessons learned are from different perspectives, okay? I'm not talking about uh, only and exclusively under the logistics point of view, under the supply chain point of view. You have quite a lot of point of view that we need to analyze. And the lessons learned is a momentum that we have to really focus carefully to take all the benefits that we can because again here is not an issue of writing books put into a drawer and forget we did nice meetings and so on for me the lessons learned is equal to say i have the lessons learned i have to pass immediately into action so this is what uh, i'm expecting and uh, uh, Honestly speaking, I believe that is uh, the perfect idea, is a perfect opportunity. Uh, we had quite a lot of challenges uh, for the humanitarian community. We had challenges even within the most developed countries. Look what's happening to Europe. Look what's happening to the United States. Look what is happening in the Latin Americas. Look what's happening to Asia. So we can get really a very rich lessons learned. Let's just take this opportunity because, in my opinion, this is really something where we can uh, we can get quite a lot in terms of outcomes. Thank you, Giuseppe. And the last question I have for you is: What would be your message to uh, your friends, colleagues, peers, uh, co-workers in the uh, humanitarian community? Um, I'm trying to find the. Uh, a diplomatic sentence. <laughs> Let's just put down the flags, okay? The flags of each uh, organization because uh, the most efficient uh, emergency response is obtained when the, when the humanitarian community is working as one. If we are working as one community, Forget about uh, the, the flags, forget about the names of the organizations because uh, all of us are working for the same beneficiary, are not different. My beneficiaries versus the beneficiary of UNHCR or UNICEF and so on and so forth. So if we want to do uh, efficient operations, then let us go as one humanitarian community. Let's us work as one. Thank you, Giuseppe, for that uh, very uh, perfect message to end with. Um, we've had lots of questions, so I feel rather guilty. We've had a lot of attendees. I haven't managed to deliver all the questions to you, but uh, I expect some people will be reaching out to you um, after this webinar, maybe with some of their questions. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening, taking the time out of what is a, a very busy schedule for you and all your, your colleagues. Uh, we do appreciate it very much. 
So on behalf of uh, Index Conference and Exhibitions, DHAD, DISAB, and um, everybody working at Index, uh, we would like to thank you so much. I'd like to thank all the attendees this evening for participating and uh, joining in this webinar. And um, Giuseppe, I'd like to give the last word to you before we say uh, good evening or good night almost. Thank you, first of all, to the audience. Uh, I know that it's an obstacle uh, topic, this one. Uh, I try to, to pass uh, simple messages um, because uh, this is a special job. Um, if somebody is not satisfied about uh, my answer is looking for clarity, yes, just knock my door through emails, through LinkedIn, through any channel you want. Thanks, of course, to I like, thanks to the ads being part, even myself, for, of the DISAB board. Of course, uh, it has been an honor, and uh, I hope that uh, I can uh, wish all the best uh, to my colleagues that are coming the next coming days. And uh, good night to everybody. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Giuseppe. It's been a pleasure. Have a good evening. Good night. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye.